Crossing the sea comes with a fair amount of potential danger. You never really know what to expect. The prospect of the other shore is never quite close enough to get a perfect close view. You may have a fair expectation of what you might encounter on the other side, but certainties are hard to come by. You may think that you're prepared for all the possible contingencies, but the calm sea is still able to turn into a raging storm and indeed fill your boat with water. By now, the disciples had a fair share of incredible, albeit terrifying, experiences at sea. First day, a boat was overtaken by the storm that Jesus miraculously calmed. Then, on another occasion, when straining at the oars, they were startled by seeing Jesus walk towards them on water. Here again, the disciples are out at sea and their hearts are once more preoccupied with the earthly concerns and focused on the wrong thing entirely. When Jesus warns them about the yeast of the Pharisees and of the Herodians, that comment goes completely over their heads. Their hearts are indeed elsewhere. Preaching on this passage reminds me of my own ocean crossing nearly three years ago now. Soon after marrying my husband Brian, we realized that he received a job in Washington DC and we had less than two months to move. Suddenly, the 12 years of my life in London seemed to come to an abrupt stop. Surely there was much excitement about our new journey together, but leaving behind my whole life, my friends, my house, my priestly discernment in the Church of England, all left me quite anxious. At that moment, despite all God's gifts and grace that I have experienced on countless of occasions in my life, and despite my knowledge, a short knowledge of God's providence in the world, all that I could think at that time were the horrible immigration concerns and our house finances. God only knows how frustrated Brian must have felt with my constant nagging and my unrelenting anxieties. Jesus is probably equally frustrated with his disciples in our passage today. Mark is generally a fast-paced gospel, but today's passage is prob probably exceeds the average. <laughs> Having first sighed deeply in his spirit with pain at the side of Pharisees demanding a sign of his divinity, and now having seen how hardened the hearts of his own disciples are, even though they have witnessed every single miracle of his, Jesus finds himself quite irritated. The barrage of nine questions, one after another, many of them quite rhetorical, gives away much about Jesus' disappointment. What started as a miracle story turns suddenly into a controversy one. Our received tradition holds that the leaven of the Pharisees and the Herodians is a symbol of pervasiveness of evil and its influence on our beliefs and actions in the world. Where the Pharisees are portrayed as overly preoccupied with legalism and following blindly the religious norms of the time, the Herodians are equally preoccupied with politics and power games. Both are symbols of the establishment and are equally committed to killing Jesus. Emily, our preacher yesterday, did a beautiful job in pointing to us the dangers of using this text in support of heinous acts and crimes of anti-Semitism that the Christian Church has for far too long endorsed. It is easy to dismiss them as the other, as the bad guys. But should the previous passage leave you still with some sort of animosity towards the Pharisees alone, today's passage dispels any sentiment of the kind. True, the Pharisees were deeply distrustful of Jesus and bent on accusing him of idolatry. But what about all those who witnessed every single miracle of Jesus and yet are completely clueless? 
One may perhaps argue that God in Christ showed to the disciple that every generous act of giving with every perfect gift of, of which James speaks today came down from the Father of lights in the ministry of Christ. And yet, despite all that grace, their eyes are still blind, their ears closed. The commentators point to us that this is probably the harshest treatment of the disciples and the gospel. Those whom Jesus selected to be his followers and to whom the secret of the kingdom of God has been revealed on countless of occasions are still ridiculously obtuse, show complete incomprehension of Jesus' actions and really seriously lack faith in him. So what about us? We who claim to follow in the footsteps of the disciples, are we equally blinded by sin and unable to perceive God's actions in the world around us? Do we too put our trust in the leaven of the Pharisees and the Herodians so that our lives rise on a calculation of control and power? Do we rest in the knowledge of God's generosity and abundance? Or are we preoccupied with the politics of control and economy of scarcity? Do our anxieties over job search and contextual ministry site search blind us temporarily to the bigger picture? Are our pursuits driven by our own will to best further our own careers in church? Or are we really responding to the discernment of God's call to his ministry in the world? Having realized the pervasiveness of evil and our fallen greedy nature, our persistent need for maintaining control in our lives and the never-ending temptations of which, James, of which James speaks today. It is perhaps easy for us to come out a little dispirited. After all, if the disciples who witnessed every miracle are still clueless, who am I to maintain my own faithfulness? And yet, the psalmist comforts us that the Lord will not forsake his people, he will not abandon his heritage, and his steadfast love will uphold them. To this day, every day and until the end of times, God in Christ points us to this Eucharistic table and whispers into our ears, why are you talking about having no bread? The trail of breadcrumbs that may be spotted throughout Jesus' ministry in Mark leads us to that sacrament of the Eucharist that is prefigured in this passage today. Each time we come to this table, we all drink from the spiritual rock of ours that is Christ Jesus, says Paul in the first letter to the Corinthians. Each time we gather around this table, we are made to remember and re-remember our history of creation and salvation in Christ. Rowan Williams points out that by identifying himself with the broken bread and the spilled blood, by identifying ourselves with our own brokenness in the world, Jesus is telling us that our death and sin that surrounds us on every side has already been overtaken by his death and resurrection. So let us rest in hope in Christ's risen, and may we have eyes to see and ears to hear that this Eucharistic table is God's best gift to us to literally resource ourselves every day. And finally, the words of comfort come also to us in the last sentence of this passage. Jesus says to them, do you not yet understand? This not yet is beautifully open to God's grace and Christ's power in the world. We know that our hearts will continue to be hardened, the pervasiveness of sin and evil will often overcome us, and that our anxieties and earthly concerns will nevertheless blind us. But Christ's power and Christ's faithfulness remains. Christ continually wills to reveal his, himself in the broken bread and the spilled wine. And, to, and he also wills to heal our eyesight, as he healed the blind man in 
but Seder in the passage that follows ours. So perhaps we would be wise to remind us, ourselves of the words of Martin Luther, whom we commemorate today, that God is our mighty fortress who breaks the oppressor's rod and wins salvation glorious. Amen.